Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, presentation. My name is Pierre Thierry, and I'm the, actually the PI of the MPIC, so I'm very proud to host you here. I'm the one who is kind of, uh, I'm not do everything, but I'm the one who is the person with the back uh, staff with MPIC. So, uh, we, but today, our, our presentation, I'm, uh, I have here Michael McKeever, who is uh, from Santa Rosa Junior College, also an MPIC partner, and Richard Grudget from Moroni College with an MPIC partner. And uh, our presentation today is about the international collaboration using an original problem-based CCNA capstone course. <coughs> so there is a history there. Some of you know that history, and I'm going to go over it now. Uh, there will be three parts in the presentation. That's why there is three presenters here. Uh, I will mainly talk about the history, and so. We had a, a very successful international project last year with Paris. Uh, so I'm from Belgium and I speak French, so I was the one who was kind of leading that project. And I will talk about it. And then uh, the person who helped me in this project uh, very much so is uh, Michael McKeever, who conceived the capstone project, uh, uh, course that was really the core of this uh, project. And I will let him talk about the capstone course. Uh, then uh, uh, I, will, you know, I will have a, a Richard Grodget come into my presentation at the beginning because uh, without Colony College, that project would not have happened, and I will explain to you why. And that's why now we are really excited that the second year we are going to do this project with China, and we have some uh, honored guests coming from China who are participating in this uh, project, and Dr. Fong who is kind of the key person here, who is kind of gonna, to whom I'm going to give the, the banner, and he's the one who's going to make this happen. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, uh, there is one takeaway besides, you know, feeling good about and, and feeling envious about us traveling and getting our students to go abroad to do this very exciting project. Uh, there is something that uh, uh, Michael will make very clear, very clear is that those of you who are teaching CCNA uh, or who know somebody who is teaching CCNA in your college, you can have access to this capstone course and we'll explain to you why and how. Uh, and you can offer that. You don't have to spend $50,000, $100,000 to go to a far, far away country. You can do it with a sister college or within a classroom. It's a, it's a very exciting capstone course that was developed and you'll be able to do that. So, a little bit of history, okay? Uh, I am uh, the, the principal of our uh, uh, NSF uh, center, and I received uh, an email uh, in March 2010. I kind of knew this email was coming, basically saying that the Office of International Science and Engineering of NSF was putting out some money for five pilot projects to do, and I put it in rest. Uh, to create experiences for a small group of U.S. community college students and the faculty mentors through active collaborations with counterpart technology educators in international science. And we are in America, and so they wanted to do it at the first time around. They say, let's do it with Europe. Okay, so we are limited to Europe. So that's where I came from. So since I had some contact in France, uh, we, we decided to do a project in France. And historically, San Francisco and Paris have their digital sister uh, accord, which is put in place in 2006 by uh, our mayor of San Francisco, who is now the uh, lieutenant governor of California, and the mayor of Paris, who is still the mayor of Paris now. And then uh, the Centre de Formation Industrielle in Paris had actually contacted Cisco because they wanted to do exchange with the U.S. and then. Uh, it just happened to uh, come to me. Uh, probably not by surprise because the, the, the coordinator of uh, uh, Cisco knew about uh, the, the programs in uh, Northern California and also the fact that I was uh, from Belgium. I guess that's up. So this is, uh, so I, I was visiting uh, my family in Belgium in the Christmas 2008-2009. Uh, and I decided to make a, a special trip to visit the friends in Paris, the, the school in Paris, and begin to make contact with them. 
And so we had a little project that was not funded, but it was kind of fun. Uh, you see the, the pictures down below. This is a LA presence from Cisco. So some students from San Francisco were meeting with some students from Paris over the telepresence. And we had a little project going together, but uh, that was the, the seed for what happened next. Uh, a few words about the, and, and I'm really curious to know how uh, it works in, in China, in Cezou, but in Paris, the Centre de Formation Industrielle is a school which is uh, sponsored by the Chamber of Commerce in Paris. So it, it's not a family school, but it's not a private school too. All the industries put some money in the Chamber of Commerce and the Chamber of Commerce has schools, technical schools and universities that are targeting the needs of the industry. Okay? And the start, this center, and, and it's very exciting, we don't have that in the U.S., they have a two-year technician program, but it's called Alternance. Now, when you see the, the blue, this is a, the year of the students. And then in blue, they are in school. In white, they are in the industry. So they have to have a industry job, and if they don't have an industry job, they will not be able to stay in the program. And the industries in France are very uh, used to this system uh, because they contribute to their fee to the Chamber of Commerce, and they host the students to two weeks, and so they have a two-year program, so the school is always full because when the first-year students are in, in the industry, the two-year two students are in classroom and vice versa. And so uh, that's kind of the, the concept. And uh, it's very, uh, uh, very popular and very uh, uh, common in France. And so that's what we were working with. And so these students, have a, you know, when they are in school, they're in school from 9 to 5. And they have programs, and they have a CCNA course. That's also what worked out. CCNA in the US, CCNA in France, the same program. OK? So we had something in common. They also have uh, uh, what's called Formation Continue. These are evening course for practitioners, but their focus is uh, youth, people 18 to 24, who are uh, finished with high school, or maybe have taken one year college and then want to have a two-year technician certificate, similar to the associate degree in the U.S. <coughs> the project uh, that we put together and that was accepted for the $100,000 grant that we got last year was uh, creating a capstone course at Ohlone College using Blackboard and CCC Confer for a group of students from the U.S. and France. Uh, they have to be in the fourth semester, the fourth course of CCNA. So they have to have, you know, uh, because it's going to be capstone. Uh, the course was delivered uh, to 24 U.S. students and 18 French students from March 22 to May 27. And then, uh, like the... Uh, the icing on the cake is that 13 of the students from, from, from the U.S. went to France with uh, Michael and myself from May 23rd to June 3rd to finish the course during the first week and during the second week to visit, visit ICT industries. So we had a, a flyer that we passed out in our classes in five colleges uh, that are partners of City College, uh, of uh, MPIC, City College, Olympic College, Santa Rosa Junior College, Putin College, Cabrillo College of Turkey Medal, and then the students had to follow certain uh, requirements. And uh, so that, that's why that was in December 2010 that we did that. Uh, the, requir the requirement flyer distributed in the partner college has these kind of criteria. They have to enroll in sub sort class. And by the way, MPIC was paying for the tuition of the American students, and the French students were taking that class in supplement to their own. Uh, a program, and so we'll tell you more about that in a minute. Uh, what was very important for me, because I travel to Europe occasionally, uh, because I still have family there, but I've never bring, brought students to, uh, to uh, a, a foreign country, and I was kind of dreading the, the problem, or the logistic problem to do this. Fortunately, my college has been working for about many, many years with a company which is called Accent International Consortium, that does that. They just do travel abro uh, study abroad for universities all over the U.S. And they have an office in Paris. So I contracted with them. So they're the one who have, uh, you know, a, a, a location in Paris, not far from the school, 
where we could stay, and they made all the travel arrangements, and they had the buses, and picking us at the airport and everything. So that was very good. Uh, they, it, it was, uh, uh, so you have a picture of uh, where we were staying there. We were staying under the arc of this uh, nice garden that is on top of uh, a North Railroad that has been replaced by a nice garden. They even gave us uh, a, a, a the, the cart in the bottom, in the left bottom is a, a cart to go in the metro, and the one on the right is a student ID or teacher ID, which we could use in the, uh, we, when we were doing tourism. So there is a little bit more information about uh, 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 working on the project, uh, lunch, etc. And then uh, we also, uh, uh, you know, had terminated our project, but Michael will talk more about that, with the telepresent meeting between uh, Caris and uh, Cisco, and that was uh, on the 27th of uh, Friday. We visited the industry uh, uh, that was arranged by the, C the CFI and Cisco. So these are the areas where we went. We went to the data center of Paris City Hall. We went to a switching center of France Telecom. We visited the IT center of the Chamber of Paris. But the most exciting is that can you imagine the U.S. if you can do that with uh, Chase or with Wells Fargo? We were in the IT of Société Générale, which is the biggest bank in Europe, and we, we really did a, a fantastic visit there. Uh, this is how the, the the visit finished. We were hosting them in a traditional French lunch. So I'm going to ask uh, my, uh, uh, I'm going to ask. Uh, I hope this is the right presentation here, yes. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Richard sure, our, to... I'll, you know, we needed to offer the course at one of the schools, and um, uh, Ohlone College is a single uh, college in this district. Uh, I know the vice president of instruction pretty well. Uh, we work well with the deans. It's a small. We were able to offer courses uh, quickly through selected topic. So I was able to put together a course, official course outline, uh, with two units uh, uh, of credit uh, that students can sign up for and, and earn credit uh, as well. And that was uh, this capstone course. And then uh, the course had to be made available to students from all of the partner schools to be able to register for. Uh, you know, here in California we have community colleges that serve their local community and, and students typically go to their local community college. Well, this was different. This was going to be a, a course offered at one institution that was open to students in a larger region and even out of state. Uh, so, uh, and I want to say yeah. something about this. I forgot to mention that uh, because I said that in my introduction. I could never create a course like this in City College in such time. It's the versatility of Oroni College that allows us to do that. In my college, it's just impossible. You know, I cannot create a site <laughs> like this. I would, I, I, I would, I would not even try to do this. And so, uh, uh, even though I'm big taste for it, but with all the mechanics, it's very simple. You know, uh, they well. it's <laughs> well. <laughs> it was easy. It was just, they just sent me a bill, you know, and I paid the bill. So I mean, let's it actually was it was pretty uh, simple, and um, you know, small is good in some cases. Uh, uh, and the students can use ICT skills to register, so they can apply online to become a student at Maloney. Um, and then they can register online, uh, uh, sign up for the courses, um, and uh, there were requirements for the course, uh, certain requirements that had to be met. We wanted to make sure we had a number of students from each of the partner institutions, so there was a restriction on enrollment. They had to go through me first and then, uh, and then be approved by Pierre and everything. But we were able to do that electronically in the RAM very smoothly. We filled the class. We had students from all the institutions as well. So mm -hmm. it worked very well. So the lesson learned uh, is that uh, this is uh, obviously the, the next the next RFP didn't come from uh, NSF anymore. So we are uh, doing this on our own. MPIC was so excited about this project and wanted to continue doing it and didn't wait for NSF to give us extra money. We just stick in the bottom of our path and we found some enough funding for this project with China. But uh, you know, we have to, you know, uh, you have to have the right connection ahead of time. We had a lot of challenge with the time zones because the time zones with Europe is nine hours. 
with the, the far is this uh, different, it's going the other way. It's a little bit easier, we, we already have figured that out. Uh, we have to talk about, for the students, about cultural differences. So we had a part of, and Michael may talk a little bit about that, we had our know, French and American students were oriented to about, you know, when you go to Paris, it's a little bit different than the U.S., you know. <laughs> so, uh, and then uh, it's very important to have an industry partner. Cisco, uh, the fact that we are working with Cisco was very important. <coughs> so we let uh, Michael talk about the custom project. <coughs> One of the things that National Science Foundation has been trying to do for the past several years is to leverage what goes on at various centers. In other words, not keep what happens at one school unique to that one school. So they have a project called Synergy, and that's about scaling and growing a project. And when we designed this course, or when we were working on this whole program, we wrote the course with the, in mind, the idea of other people being able to use it. That it wasn't going to be just done once and that would be it. So the class, because Cisco Academy is worldwide, it sort of makes it a little bit easier to reuse the course and that's what we're going to use uh, with our Chinese students. And what you'll find at the end of this presentation is I'm going to go through some of the technical parts of the, of the course and what we talk, taught and how it was conducted. But part of the goal of this was to be able to make this available to people in the states, anywhere in the country, so that schools within a city across a state or across the country could reuse this as a capstone course in order to further their curriculum and advance their programs without having to go through the process of recreating everything. We've provided everything on thumb drives to faculty and uh, all of the lectures that we did last year are available to faculty to view and to use in their classes this year. So we're recycling and reusing the material and if anybody is interested in reusing it and you're welcome to contact us. Uh, I think Rick Graziani might be interested in, in, in using some of this. Um, but the, the idea was to build it with that in mind. And as such, there were a number of pieces that we had to put into play. Because everybody was taking the same course and had gone through the same material, we knew that we had a baseline from which we could then build on. And we knew what comes next in the, in the sort of in the curriculum or in the canon of, uh, of Cisco curriculum. So we could, the, the idea was to give them what comes next. So that's why it was a capstone. We gave them a little bit of the advanced topics that follow their current curriculum. So we had six, five or six topics uh, that we used. And part of what we were trying to do with this project in Paris was to compare and to contrast learning styles, uh, educational systems, to see how the students would work in teams from different cultures. And as Pierre mentioned, one of the things that we did was I gave the students, uh, we, we gave all the U.S. students a book called Culture Shock France. And it's a series, Culture Shock is the series and they're for a bunch of different countries around the world. It's very different there. You don't smile when, to people when you're in Paris. In France, you don't smile. It's, you know, as much. I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit. But you don't greet somebody and have this big smile because then you're an annoying American. So uh, there, there were just, you know, we, we tried to get them oriented. Uh, but we wanted to see the differences. We wanted to see how they would work together. And we create, and the course was set up with teams. So there was a project. And the project, in essence, was the merging of two companies, two networks. And we designed the course so that there would be problems that they would have to solve when these two uh, networks are merged. And the six topics that we introduced them to were their opportunity to include these topics in their solution to merging these two companies together. Some of the things that Pierre did not mention back with lessons learned um, was very interesting cultural differences. And what's really exciting about now working with the team from China is going to be for us to compare and contrast the learning styles and the differences in what we saw and worked with in Europe with what we are going to be doing in China. And there are some 
you know, we already have some expectations about how the teams are going to work together. To be quite honest, they did not work together in Paris because of the, the time zone. We were 8 o'clock in the morning here. It was 3 in the afternoon there. It was the end of their day. They were tired. Um, there was no incentive for them to continue. There was, there was it, just it was actually 5 o'clock in the afternoon, 5 to 7. 5 when we were done? 5, yeah. So when we started. When we started. Yeah. So it was, it was a very long day for them. So there were a number of, uh, and, and during the time when they were at work, they were not at school at all. They did not answer emails. They were not thinking about school. So there were some of these issues that we didn't know about when we started off that were a challenge. Nonetheless, we had a number of tools that we tried to get them to use in order to communicate, but we really wanted them to use uh, a lot of their soft skills in addition to their technical skills in order to have a real life experience about what it's like to work on an international team. So the, the premise of this was, yes, technology is at the foundation of it, both for teaching the course as well as for what they had to solve, but what was even more important was their interaction with one another, how they were going to uh, solve their problems of language and of the time zone and what form they were going to use to communicate. And Hopefully, we'll have. We, I know we've learned from that project as to how we can improve the next one. So, um, it's nice to be able to build on something that we've done, and that's not always something that we're able to do uh, with some of these projects and some of these grants. So, for the technical stuff, um, if you're interested in there's routing protocols and IPv6 and um, static routes, and we, and we created scenarios in an environment in which they had to use their existing skills and their new skills in order to solve and to come up with creative solutions and problems. Um, they had to solve a lot of logistical problems. We gave them some tools to figure out how to manage their time uh, and how to be creative. This is uh, the, the platform that we used to teach the course. I was at my house in my office at 8 o'clock in the morning teaching to students throughout California and Nevada and the students in Paris in their classroom at the same time. And in this platform, I could put students into breakout rooms. We could, in essence, take the teams and put them into separate rooms so they could work together. So we could lecture. I, I taught this, I, uh, this class with another faculty member, uh, Daniela, at Ohlone College. So the two of us taught this course together and we worked on it together. And so we could uh, give the, the teams time to work together. We had three or four students in the U.S. and three or four students in Paris representing a company. And each company was a team that had to merge together. And so they had to figure out how they were going to communicate, how they were going to use the new information that we gave them. So we gave them a number of different platforms to work in. They could use this environment that we use to teach the course, which is um, Blackboard Collaborate, given to California community colleges for free by a grant from the Chancellor's Office. So within this environment, it's very rich, and we presented the course, the material. Um, the schematic of the course and, and the way that the students were able to do their programming and configure the routers and the devices was through a software package called Packet Tracer. It's a software simulator that allows you to build networks to populate it with routers and switches and PCs and other devices. And what we're able to do is to use a, a function of Packet Tracer that allows Packet Tracer on your machine to connect to Packet Tracer on my machine. So on your machine you have your network, on my machine I have my network. And I put something in the middle so that the two machines could communicate with each other. So you could do something on your side and I could do something on my side. And through your machine across the internet, through our machines, we'd be able to, to share packet tracer information. So that's sort of what you see going on in the middle. On the left is the topology or the network for the US side and then a mirrored or similar topology that was used for France on the other side and then a couple of devices in between connecting them. And we're just connecting two PCs together that are running software. This is just software running on two machines, and we're able to connect those two machines running the software in between, and it shared the protocols and the packets and the information between the two machines so that it was very much like a, a real-world network. So it was all done in software. Um, getting a little more technical, there's, there's a, a number of uh, protocols that were in here that were built in. 
Um, each side had a different way that they communicated. There was one routing protocol on one side, another routing protocol on the other side. Um, both sides had the same IP addressing space, the private IP addressing. So all of a sudden you've got machines on both sides with the same addressing that have to now communicate with each other. So how are they going to do that? What solution would the students come up with? And we gave them uh, IP version 6 as an option and we gave them other tools and technologies that they could choose from. And part of this was not that there was a single right answer. This is how the, the two devices, the two networks communicated uh, through this other instance of packet tracer in between. There was not a right answer for this. There was no best solution. There were just lots of different options that the students could come up with. And at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the course, they had to give a presentation. They stood up in front of uh, the faculty, Pierre and myself, as well as the faculty at the school in Paris, and um, representatives of Cisco and the Cisco headquarters in Paris, which is where we conducted the, their um, project presentations. So they and had at the same time in, in San Jose, Richard Goodyear was there with Daniela. Uh, Vivek, and then they had a few students. We, I just showed you the pictures. And so there was actually one presentation from San Jose that was done at that time. So we used technology to teach the class, and the class was about technology. So as Pierre said, when these presentations were going on in Paris, there were what, three or four students? There were five students in San Jose. Five students in Richard and Daniela in San Jose at Cisco <coughs> headquarters there, telepresence. And so we could see them, and they saw us, and the teams. We had uh, 24 U.S. students, and of them, 13 went to Paris. So the ones that stayed in the States were able to still participate in the presentation by going to Cisco headquarters and participating in the, present, in the, the telepresence session. So they worked with their team in presenting their solution. And we asked them, well, why did you do this? It wasn't just a matter of they stood up and told us what they were going to do. We queried them and asked them, well, why did you do this? Did you think about that? in order to get them to, to probe a little bit further as to what they were doing and why. So it was really a lot about the soft skills. The technology, the technology part um, was really the format that, in, that allowed us to see how people would work together because that's really what goes on in the world. We hear from employers all the time that it's not the technical skills that they know, it's how well they work with someone and, and all the soft skills. Some of the uh, ideas that we had were we did not want to tell the students how to communicate with one another. We wanted them to figure that out. We had a certain amount of class time, but they had to obviously work together in order to figure out the solution to the problem that they had. They had to communicate with each other, but we did not tell them when and how. We gave them some tools. VoiceThread is a, an interesting product. and. How we do that in China may be very interesting because of some of the blocks to social networking and how we're able to communicate. So that's going to be an interesting process to see how. Uh, pardon? But it's going to be interesting to see just the different cultures and the different societies how that communication takes place, and that's just part of the process that people have to figure out working in different cultures and different societies. I have students that take my class, and they've taken the class from China while they've been on business trips. I've had students taking my class from Africa. From I've taught from the Philippines. So, you know, you, you work in all these different environments all over the world, and the students need to get used to it. So we wanted them to figure that out, and some were better at it than others. Um, but we felt that it was important that they be given the opportunity to figure this out for themselves without so much of our uh, direct input. Other technologies that were involved in this, um, for those of you that are familiar with Wireshark, it's a, a packet examining t software tool. Um, we gave the students a whole lot more material and resources than we asked them to use. There's a lot of material that we provided them uh, with in order to go further with their studies. It really was a capstone course. Uh, we, we gave it a significant amount of rigor as well as sort of a fun opportunity to, to work in, in Paris and to go on that trip as well as to work with students here. So we tried to make it a balance between the rigor as well as the, you know, and academia as well as making it 
a social project as well. So I'm not quite sure how they struck that balance, but uh, that was part of the attempt. There were um, some amazing events, things that took place from students uh, that really worked hard to figure out problems. One guy said that there was a problem they come up with and there was the hard way and the harder way to solve the problem and he chose the harder way, which kept me up till three in the morning working with him as to how to do IPv6 route redistribution with EIGRP and OSPF in Packet Tracer. But we did it. He figured it all out. And it was amazing to see the growth and the change in a lot of the students. Some of them that were very shy and reserved, both we heard in Paris, who would not speak a word throughout the class. They were the ones that were taking our students on tours of the city. They, they, they completely changed, they transformed. So there were a lot of interesting results that occurred, not just the teaching of technology and what they learned from our, you know, from the, the rigor of the course, but how they changed as people as well. And, and interacting with another culture was you know, a, a big growth for everybody on both sides. So we're looking forward to that again. So that was the, that was the course, the project, of, and the sort of the product that we created that we're reusing. And and so our, when we went to a, a meeting in uh, October, first we had I had some discussion with Richard and Dr. Fong about uh, the possibility of working with China and the the, pro, the, the, the school in Suzhou. And then uh, I was waiting for uh, you know the next grant funding from NSF. And it was very clear that it was not coming, but we wanted to do it. So uh, I looked at the finances of uh, my 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 grant, my MP grant, and uh, since we have been for Simon News, we have been you know good with uh, spending our money for the first three years. For year four, we were able to find enough money to fund this project. So I I thought uh, my program officer, I said, this is the project we want to do. Do I get the okay to do it? And guess what they did? They said, do it. And we explained to them that, you know, we wanted to continue on this uh, uh, experience. And it would be so great to be able to now do it with China. So we got the OK. And so I, I gave the money to uh, Ordoni College to run this. And so now, uh, Richard. Yeah, and I was so happy to hear that because <coughs> from MPEC, you know, Mid Pacific ICT Center, it just seemed a natural partnership to work with our partners across the Pacific in China rather That's than right. in Europe. So, uh, uh, but uh, we actually had a long-standing relationship. I'd like to introduce Dr. Fong. If you could come up here, Dr. Fong. Uh, because this is not... Uh, come on up. And um, because we... The, you cannot build this relationship, this collaborative class, overnight. It has to come with a long relationship that you've already developed. And we had that at, in Fremont. So, Dr. Fong, you want to tell us a little bit about yeah, your I'm work? Very, I'm very happy to be here to uh, talk about this uh, capstone project. So number one, and uh, thank you, and the uh, uh, Michael, for such a solid foundation we have so we can have a, a real model to follow. Yeah. And the second, the second issue is, uh, as an 18 years uh, California community college faculty, I get the really great support to find uh, my dean. Uh, I'm still here last year, and uh, from my colleague, and uh, Rich Grodig, and also from our other colleagues. So, so, so that's the support to issue. Uh, let me feel we can make it. And uh, as a natural Chinese speaker for me, and uh, I'm working with Aloni for 18 years. And uh, my background is engineering and computer science from Colombia. So I know and uh, both sides very well. And also, I know this is, is uh, from the old aspect of the win-win situation for bringing this kind of uh, the technological education to other side of Pacific. And uh, Suzu Industry Park is about, uh, uh, the, if we take a point in time, is about 20 minutes from 
uh, the most famous metropolitan city of Shanghai, 20 minutes, 50 miles. So, and uh, so it is just a neighborhood of California, because from SFO to, to Putong Airport is about uh, uh, 11 to 13 hours only, only. Mm -hmm. Compared with the, uh, the, the bus drive to the to the San Diego, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and one issue I want to emphasize that is a social industrial park. You know, this is about 16 years ago. This is 100 percent beautiful farmland. Now, and the government of Singapore and the government and, and the China. Now, this social industrial park become, I, I, would, I would rather say, one of the best in China for the industrial park. If you, you stay there, if you visit there, you will find that it is very European style. Not too much Chinese style for noise, but you have a Chinese style for gray style. Gray style. And, uh, <laughs> And with uh, more than 100 companies from Fortune 500, and uh, sit there, and uh, and the people can you can find the people from all over the Chinese and the American the bigger company IBM, Cisco, HP, you name it, and AMD have a big site over there, and uh, and also a lot of uh, the engineer from India and from Pakistan and from other party. So this is very international and reflects the, this global economics and the WTO and the framework. So uh, for us, we hear this is Cisco is very really great for the win-win situation for both California, America, and the, and the Cisco. So I'm very glad that we make it, and thank you everybody here yeah. to support it. Thank you. Thank you. So Dr. Fong set the uh, platform for us. We actually uh, uh, went to uh, 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 summer of 2010. Uh, myself and other faculty members, uh, Rick Graziani, also from Cabrillo College, went to uh, uh, the school site in Sugo China and introduced them to networking and packet tracer for the first time. Um, Uh, you know, it was a different experience there. Uh, these were young students, uh, a couple years out of high school in their uh, early 20s. Uh, um, many more females in their classes than we have here in the U.S., which was very good. Uh, Rick was there working in teams with students, very enthusiastic, and he can tell you great stories about so his experience. <laughs> So we. This young girl is in the Greek who was her first Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, because of this first year, uh, we developed uh, a networking program at the school in China with the Cisco Academy, and they hired staff instructors to do that who are here today with us. Sean and uh, Alan and Joyce are here and uh, will be with us for a couple weeks visiting their first time here in America. Um, very uh, great enthusiasm for the program there. So this was in the second summer. Um, we had a security project in the summer of 2011. I was participating in that, and Dennis Frezzo from Cisco uh, Systems also was there uh, as volunteer teachers for two weeks each to do this special project with students uh, uh, in their classes. Classrooms are different there. They have. Uh, up to 40 students uh, in the classroom in the computer lab. So we had a very large class of 40 students doing their uh, Cisco networking classes. Uh, I got to meet many of the students. They all came with their Western names. There's Angelia and Derek and Rachel. Some of them came up with their name the first day I met them. Some of them even asked me to give them a name. <laughs> uh, others were a little different. This is Helen, Tommy, Rachel, but there were others. Uh, there was a Byron, uh, Spider, uh, J-Lo, Rex. <laughs> so these were just very enthusiastic students. Uh, uh, it was such a great experience uh, for me to work with them uh, uh, over there. They were, it was wonderful. So those students will work just great with our students here. Um, 
They had to do presentations at the end of the project in English. Yeah, it was hard for them. Uh, they're very, they understand English very well, written and reading, as from somewhat similar to the way we learn languages here. Uh, but their verbal skills, uh, they're enthusiastic, they're willing, uh, and we'd like to do that again with them. Uh, so we have this planned project uh, to do the same kind of capstone program that Michael talked about here already to go and visit China. Uh, we're hoping to start in March. We'll have maybe uh, 20 students here in the U.S. and 20 students there collaborating together on this network that they have to combine. And then at the end of the semester in May, uh, 12 to 14 U.S. students will travel over there um, to uh, work with their uh, Chinese counterparts and do their presentations. Okay. So the, again, to sort of wrap this up, it's really cool that I got to go to Paris and it's really cool that Rick and Richard got to go to China. And I think it enhances education in the States for our students and it broadens their perspectives. But at the same time, uh, if anybody's interested in teaching the class, we've got the material and you don't have to go to China. You can set up packet tracer between two schools in the same city, across the country in the same state. Um, it's, it's a pretty easy thing to do. The, the topics are all there. If you don't know the material ahead of time, you can use our lectures to learn it. You can use our lectures to teach your students from. Um, so the idea was to really give the whole thing away, and we've given it away to about 50 Cisco teachers uh, last summer at a conference in San Jose. So if anybody's interested in it online or hearing the archive, you can contact us. Uh, we'll be happy to work with you if anybody's interested in setting up a capstone course between schools, uh, between classes, that would be something we could discuss as well. So the idea is really to reuse this stuff and it's not just a one-off, not just to get to travel over to Europe or to China, but really to be able to, to disseminate what we've learned technically as well as socially in the States as well. Reaching, so how else have we reached out to other schools with it thus far has been through our conferences and through Cisco Networking Academy conferences. So we, we actually, there is nobody from Cisco here but he's around and we should re remind that we are hoping that Cisco will pick this up because I think it's a great opportunity. This course is already developed. They could actually refine it and distribute it worldwide. And I think this is our hope. You know, I mean, we are it's a, a, a project that is, it would cost very little for Cisco to pick it up. We have already talked to them about it. You know, the fact that, uh, you know, Dennis Prezzo, who is a key person in Cisco in, in the area of uh, project development, is, uh, is familiar with this. So that's my hope. I mean, if Cisco would decide to take it on and make it available worldwide, uh, I mean, we've done a job, you know. But uh, right now, like Michael said, what we can do is uh, present it at conference, uh, advertising on our website, and also our Cisco conference last year, San Jose this year, we're going to certainly do another plug for it uh, at the Cisco conference. Yeah. When you were in China during the summer, were you actually doing instruction? How, how did that work? Can we get the question? Length of time or? Yeah, the question, the question was about uh, our time in, in uh, China in the summer. We, it was a teaching opportunity. We had a project uh, with lesson plans. I met with the students every day of the week uh, during the classes uh, for two weeks. It was a two-week project. So what, what Dr. Feng didn't really mention in detail is that Ohlone College and the school in Suzhou have, uh, long, have been uh, in relationship for many other courses besides networking. Right. right, the teaching ESL, the teaching other courses, and so there's been a group of faculty from Ohlone over the past few summers who have gone teaching for short-term courses in uh, Suzu, and that's why we have already established this relationship with them. That's how, many, how many hours per day was the class? How many hours per day? Uh, the classes uh, in Suzu are three, three hours some days. Three hours a week. Yeah. So at least the whole a day. Yeah. Three hours a day for five minutes. Yeah, we have three hour class blocks of time, yeah. Yes, Rick. I, I just want to, my, what I want to know is I brought back probably more than I took over as far as what I learned. Uh, my, the sense of uh, teamwork and 
his work ethic and how hard the students worked and worked together uh, was just uh, incredible. I taught at the beginning of every one of my classes now uh, to my students. Did you pick the Anyway, I talked to all my students before every my classes about just I learned a lot from the Chinese school. And I think we have a lot to learn from other cultures. I, I would kind of indicate the same thing. I didn't teach at that university in China, but I taught at Southeast University in Beijing. I know there are many universities mm -hmm. in Suzhou mm -hmm. that are combined. There's a huge campus from a high faculty who have taught there for me as well. And I was there for three weeks teaching grant school. And the students are phenomenal. The people are phenomenal. I mean, it was like um, something that you recognize that the, the problems here in the world are not with the people, but with the politicians. And <laughs> really, the people there are just like us in terms of what they want for their children, what they want for themselves. They want to have better opportunities for their kids, just like we do. And the students were fabulous. I mean, they took me all over to visit places that probably no one else uh, in a normal environment gets to see. There's a huge Buddhist temple where there are women only, the nuns are in there. <laughs> but they all look the same. There's no hair, they have unisex clothing. But it was a, a wonderful place to visit and to teach at. Oh, and I learned a significant amount from the students that I had as well. And, and to, to a large degree, that's what NSF was looking for when we went to Europe, because there's been international exchange in math and in science and in the arts and in the humanities. But part of their impetus for funding that Project Paris that we're following up now in China was that this hasn't taken place in the, techno in the technical field. So they wanted to see, well, does foreign exchange work? What's the value? What's the benefit of it? in this particular discipline. And I'd echo the same thing about what happened in Paris and in France, the different cultures. I mean, we got into places, as Pierre was saying, into the bank, it's like a knock. There's no way, they don't, they didn't let the French students in after we left. They said the only reason where we got in was because we came over from the States and there was a special, special deal. We got in to see stuff that, from a security perspective, we shouldn't have gotten in to see. It was a trip. The one thing that I did find a little bit annoying was that when I was teaching, everybody had their cell phones up. They were using their cell phones all the time. And they weren't taking exams or anything. So I finally asked the grad student, it was my chief grad aide, I said, well, what is going on here? And he said, well, they're looking at the words you use. <laughs> and I said, well, they need to tell me. They don't understand words. So their vocabulary, like you say, was fairly well. I mean, a lot of foreign countries, not just China, they learn by watching movies, by you know, somewhat interacting with Americans or U.S. speaking people. But basically, maybe 5,000 words or more or less that they might know in terms of vocabulary. But like you said, not in our technology area. There are a lot of words we use, even in business and technology, that they're just it's literally foreign to them. And those are the words that they, they, everybody uses the American words now. Right. So. Yeah, what was great about our teaching over there is that we were teaching hands-on activities that have no real language associated with them. They're doing things and things have to work, so um, it made it uh, easier. Great, guys. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, so we are done. We see from Epic and from you already. Well, good luck to our partners in China. Thank you for coming to our event, uh, everybody, but especially to our Chinese friends, and we're going to see more of you. you know,